are. Yeah. Well, Yeah. 
Welcome you to uh, our lecture today. Um, Marilla Tanta is um, one of our first uh, dissertation fellows here at the Institute. We have two this year, and so we're very happy to host her. Um, before we get started, I want to make a couple of announcements about some upcoming events here at the Institute. The next fellows lecture will also be one of, will be our other dissertation fellow, and that'll be Ann Parsons from the History Department, and she's going to lecture on um, April 2nd on di Diagnosing Danger, Mental Hospitals, Prisons, and Reinstitutionalization. So I hope you'll all come for that. I also want to remind you that we have a visiting fellow here in March, Nancy Frazier, who's a political scientist and philosopher from the New School for Social, Social Research in New York. She'll be here on um, Mar uh, March 13th. Um, giving a public lecture entitled Theorizing the Crisis of Capitalism in the 21st Century. And she's also going to present a seminar uh, on March 14th in the afternoon on Feminism, Capitalism, and the Cunning of History, um, which is based on a piece that she published in New Left Review, which is available on our website or via our website. Uh, I also want to let you know about some of the other events that are coming up here uh, that are sponsored by some of our working groups, and these are interdisciplinary groups of faculty who get together both formally and informally here at the Institute to read, exchange work, talk to each other, uh, bring in speakers, and so forth. So next Tuesday, February 21st, there's a brown bag uh, hosted by our Chicago Area Food Studies group, and that will be featuring Lori Batista, who is the new director of the African American Cultural Center here at UIC. She's going to talk about um, urban agriculture, and, uh, urban agricultural movements in Chicago. And the next day, Wednesday, February 22nd, our forum on um, publics, cultures, and practices of difference will host a book discussion on Arturo Escobar's Territories of Difference. And that book is available at the UIC bookstore. Uh, Thursday, February 28th, the Forum for Research on Law, Politics, and the Humanities will host Bruce Robbins from Columbia University, and he will speak, uh, his title, his lecture will be called The Beneficiary, Cosmopolitanism and Inequality. And there's one more um, working group that I want to mention, particularly to this audience, and that is on March 5th. The Visual Cultures Working Group will host Jorge Coronado, from Northwestern who will be speaking on portraits and meaning. Um, so there, those and many other events are happening at the Institute in the next few weeks. Um, now I would like to introduce Hannah Higgins who is going to give an introduction to our speaker today. Thank you. This is so nice. I love these events. It's rare we get together across the campus like this and 
This is perfect. So I will do my best to introduce our speaker, um, although I feel a bit of an interloper because there are scholars in this university who know Morella's material better than I do. Um, uh, Morella has her BA in philosophy uh, from Alexandru E. Cusa University in Romania, uh, which she achieved in 1997. Um, so clearly uh, Morella is from Romania, uh, where she studied philosophy, taught philosophy, and directed theater. Uh, she came to the United States in 1999 as part of the um, international writing program at the University of Iowa. And the publication that she produced in connection to that was a chapbook, poetry chapbook called Tight Fist. Um, she started her PhD in art history here at UIC in 2005, and she's working on her dissertation, Didactic Art or Sites of Resistance, Socialist Realism in Romania. Pretty close. <laughs> um, and uh, her area, I know, I'm sure. I, I think I changed mine as I submitted it. Uh, power and it, her areas of interest are power and ideology in art, modern and contemporary European art, 20th century art, critical theory, social and socialist realism in painting, architecture and film, philosophy and aesthetics. So this is someone with a broad and voracious appetite uh, for knowledge. Um, uh, Morella has presented a number of important papers as a graduate student. Uh, the Disobedient Model in Postmodern Portraiture, Marlene Dumas's 100 Models and Rejects. Uh, she presented on the Tableau Piège and the Trap of the Ordinary in Daniel Spurry's artwork. I'll give a plug to the University of Chicago Smart Museum show right now, which has a large uh, Spurry installation. Peter can attest to that. Peter Hales was there last night at the opening. Um, and uh, another uh, paper called I Refuse to See the World in a Personal Way, Gerhard Richter Blurred Painting. So I'm giving you those titles just to indicate that Morella, while she's very specialized in this material, is um, actively pursuing a wide range of uh, research areas in modern and contemporary art. Um, she's taught here at UIC and at Columbia College Chicago extensively, um, a broad range of courses, and is currently working on a number of publications. Uh, before a national anthem and a place of citizenship, um, uh, publishing in the Bucharest Meeting Europe, Strasbourg. I don't know how to read this. Apollonia <laughs> European <laughs> Art Exchange. Somewhere in there is is a location that is probably not local, <laughs> <laughs> and therefore not in a local format. Um, she's also preparing her chapter um, from wife to prime minister socialist realist paintings of Elena Ceausescu which is um, being prepared for publication. And in Romania, she has published The Industrial Identity in Autopos magazine, Ayasi, Romania, and also The Limit of My Language is Not the Limit of My Art, um, also in um, Autopos magazine in Romania. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, this is a very accomplished graduate student. She has a wide range of fellowships. In addition to the Institute for the Humanities Dissertation Fellowship, uh, Morella had a Dean Scholar Award. Um, and a number of graduates, years and years of fabulous graduate student support. So thank you. We look forward to hearing you speak. Don't be nervous. I'll just turn off the mic first. Thank you, Hannah, for this kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming. And I really want to thank the, all the fellows and uh, Susan Levin and Linda Barbara for. There are two. Not this one. <laughs> this is this is not real. <laughs> this one. Better? No? This is for the web? Okay. Okay. Um, I receive wonderful feedback and uh, it has been very, very productive for me, um, this um, residence. And I want to thank you all for that, for your time and thoughtful feedbacks. Today I'm going to talk about paintings, but however, I will start with where the paintings are located. 
um, <laughs> the Romanian National Museum of Contemporary Art acts as the empirical repository for the collection of social realist paintings. However, the museum also acts as the site for lively poli social, political, and aesthetic debates awakened by the museum's inclusion inside the f former dicta dictator's palace. And this is where I found them. And I just want, because you spoke about spoiling, because the box that I used to have lunch and it's a huge piece by Daniel Spoeri. Oh, yes. <laughs> he, he donated to the museum when the museum opened um, in 2004 and I really wanted to see what was inside. There was, was no way to open it. Then. Before 1989 and during the communist regime, Ceausescu's palace was named the House of the Republic, although for most Romanians even today it remains Casa Poporului, the people's house. The building was supposed to serve as a residence for the Ceausescu couple and their communist party. During the December 89 revolution, the dictator Nicolae Ceausescu and his wife Elena were ousted and executed by firing squad on Christmas Day in the city of Târgoviște. In 2004, the building became the Palace of Parliament, the site for the newly formed parliament. And what you see here is the west wing of the palace. Also in 2004, the first National Museum of Contemporary Art opened inside the palace. Former Prime Minister Adriana Stase, a self-proclaimed patron of arts, proposed and financed in deep secret, as architect Augustin Ioan tells us, the location of the museum inside the palace. This happened to take place before the parliamentary and presidential elections in 2004. And Romanian politicians welcomed the cathartic role of art, which will, quote, clean the building of any reminiscences of the former dictatorial rule and make freedom of expression possible, end quote. And just three weeks ago, Adriana Stasi was sentenced for two years in prison for corruption charges. And he did not win the election in 2004. What kind of occasion for cultural exchange that the muse does the museum and its location provide? Ironically, the People's House once again seems to represent the center that administers aesthetic and political values. This transformation from an authoritarian symbol to a metaphor for a freedom happened without a public debate or as contemporary artist Dan Perzhovsky put it, first it was a rumor, then it was too late. It cost $12 million to convert the palace's Baroque interior style into a white cube, and also the two glass outside elevators. To build a museum space from scratch would probably have been cheaper, according to Perzhovsky. What does it mean to situate the Museum of Contemporary Art in a building that still symbolizes a totalitarian dictator? Is such a transformation at all possible? In what ways and to what extent that reusing a building reuse its ideology? Conceptually, the building itself exists as an aesthetic and political spatial disruption. Not only its immensity, the third largest building in the world, precludes an all at once understanding of the building, but its performative functions, former politics, current politics, and current art gallery space do so as well. When part of the building is experienced as one thing, art exhibition, the other part is experienced as something else, political negotiation. The gallery space then is located where the parliament is not. Construction of the palace started in 1984 and it materialized Ceausescu's majestic architectural plan for Bucharest, the civic center. A significant portion of the historical center of Bucharest, including 40,000 buildings, were demolished for the House of the Republic and its four kilometer long, one meter wide Victory of Socialism Boulevard. And just wanted to let you know that the boulevard um, is six meter longer and one meter, one meter wider than Champs Elysees. Mm -hmm. And Ceausescu really was keen about doing it at least with one meter longer than Champs Elysees. Um, 700 architects and about 20,000 workers work day and night, three shifts, 24 hours a day, so that most of the building could be erected by 1989. 20% of Bucharest was torn down to build this palace. 
an empty pla plaza in the front, now a parking lot for tourist buses, allowed for millions of people to worship Ceausescu i Grandia spectacles. And I should have added a new function of the palace, which is open for tourism, the, one of the wings. Ceausescu's monumental vision of Bucharest lines up with other totalitarian visions of new worlds. The dictator becomes the architect of the new nation, and the future is built in a symbolic way, ideology, and didactic art, and in a literal way, with bricks and bulldozers. In his book, Totalitarian Art, Igor Golamstak discusses totalitarian countries' interest in architecture as being central. In totalitarian thinking, end quote, in totalitarian thinking, the task of scientifically constructing an advanced society and a new man was strongly associated with more ordinary processes of construction. The ideal image of the future state was that of a splendid architectural construction that would endure for centuries. It may be for this reason that enormous attention was devoted in all totalitarian countries to the development of architecture. A special role and function in the creation of the state was attributed to it, and it was controlled in at least as centralized a manner as all other spheres of creativity." End quote. The palace has 1,100 rooms and is 12 stories tall, with four additional underground level currently available and in use, with another four in different stage of, stages of completion. In a time of ration food and electricity for Romanians, the estimates of the material used include, I will just give you two numbers. I just want to, you to visualize the absurdity of the situation, not just the size of the building. Um, it was 1 million cubic meters of marble, 3,500 metric tons of crystal, 480 chandeliers, over 1,500 1, ceiling lights and mirrors, and so on. Some of the halls of the palace are bigger than a football field and were designed for the spe special glorification of the ruling part, pair. For example, one can still see the 25 feet tall empty spaces at both ends of a huge hall, which were meant to shelter the oversized portraits of Ceausescu and his wife, Elena. Mm -hmm. The extravagant excesses of expensive materials, the exaggerations of size, the utter uselessness of the building are not just abuses of the real, but, quote, a world vision which has become objectified, end quote. It is spectacle. The individual cannot comprehend the whole, not because it surpasses him, but in an ironic way, it includes him, and is, it is built with his help, an aesthetic agreement. No one inhabits the people's house. In the board's concept of spectacle in a consumer society, spectacle has the ability to adapt to consumer's critique and transform, transforms them into a need fulfilled immediately through images. Society involves the consumer in the creation of values, which in fact is what the board calls a lack of will, specific to a mechanized society. It is this lack of will that permitted the palace to be built, ironically in the name of the people. The lack of opposition appeared in communist Romania not because, quote, the commodity has attained the total occupation of social life, end quote, but because the continual homogenization of the individual paralyzed the necessary difference for a heterogenic society. In both cases, modern society in the board's critique and communist society, the individual opera operates as a docile consumer and creative of, of the spectacle and the spectacle becomes self-producing. The palace becomes an unfortunate tautology of utopia and reality. Was the placement of the museum in the palace possible because of residual lack of will on behalf of Romanian public, which, will, which still believes that any change is a good change? An alternative to the communist plan in Romania was impossible because it would have been understood as an imperfection. The architects working on the palace needed to fulfill Ceausescu's dream of representing the absolute power of an absolute collective. The bigness does not exclude the small, the individual and the specific. How ironic then when the individual becomes the reason for the collective.
In fact, it might be more appropriate to say that Bucharest is around the palace than to say that the palace is situated in Bucharest. Ceausescu alternated his majestic architectural plans with his working visits around the country. He visited the countryside where he inspected displays of polyester and meat and fruit decorating the otherwise empty window shops. Before Ceausescu's arrival in a city, streets were clean, benches and tree trunks would be painted white and even if not in season, flowers would decorate windows, sidewalks and parks. The number of slogans and portraits already implanted everywhere in the city would be double. The visual symbols of, a, of an inhabited utopia must be permanently reinforced and they must comprise public and private space with the same persistence. Didactic art must serve this purpose. The period of relaxed culture production ended after Ceausescu's return from China and North Korea, when Ceausescu proposed a new cultural revolution with the Chinese model in mind. Ceausescu's cultural revolution, known as July Thesis 1971, reformed the necessary socio-political role of intellectual production. The censorship of the artistic <coughs> production changed drastically the existence of any artistic autonomy other than the state subordinate one. Historian Catherine Verdery tells us that but just a few months after his visit to China, Ceausescu started, quote, an offensive against culture's autonomy, condemned the liberation of 65, and reestablished an index of prohibited books and authors, end quote. Impressed with the spectacle created around Mao and his wife, Nicolae and Elena Ceausescu wanted to create their own grand aura. In 74, Ceausescu was elected the president of Romania, and this was a position specially invented for him by the party. It's, it's unheard of in communist country. You have comrades, but not presidents. Um, and the Ceausescu golden era began. The golden era euphemistically encapsulates what is commonly considered the darkest part of Ceausescu's regime. The crackdown on freedom of expression drastically affected artistic production. Also, the production of portraits and homage paintings increased dramatically, and the totalitarian triangle of party state, the artist union, and the artist reinforced with a new vigor. Artists were employed by the state following the Soviet model, and socialist realism was declared the official style. But even before that, in 1966, when Ceausescu became the general secretary of the Romanian Communist Party, the politics of Romania followed the Stalinist program, program by the book. Politicians and artists were trained in Moscow and they acted more as representatives of the Soviet Union in Romania than local Romanians. The intellectuals and artists received special attention from the beginning since they were in charge of what historian Magda Kernetsch calls the symbolic capital. Limiting art's impact on society and controlling access to artistic production was not enough for the Romanian regime. Socialist realism was declared the visual language of the party. The regime decided to use the art to consolidate its power, its view of the world. As historian Caterina Preda observes in her comparison between Pinochet's regime and Ceausescu's regime, the art in Romania had the task to, quote, create and to do so in accordance with the idea, ideological precepts. Moreover, the artists were converted into workers with a five-year plan whereby their creativity was to be coordinated and regulated just as in all other domains of activity. The sole engineers were forced to pay public tribute if they wanted to pursue their creative endeavors. A strong system of censorship assured that they do so." End quote. The visual rhetoric of the official style had to simplify and to repeat endlessly a number of political theses. The happiness of people living in communist Romania, the proletarian hero, the heroine mother, the heroes of the revolution, and so on. After Ceausescu decided in 1968 to reduce the Soviet in political influence in Romania, socialist realism needed to legitimize a new socialist utopia which was a continuation of an old utopia, but this new utopia was a better one. And also 
1968 is the year of his famous speech when he publicly declared um, his refusal to invade Czechoslovakia, which made him very popular among Romanians and also fooled the West in thinking that he's actually turning against the Soviet Union, which did not happen. But what does it mean to perfect an utopia? And more than that, how do you paint in order to prove the reality of a utopia? It is an exaggeration of the role of arts to the extent that it does not serve the leader and the party, but it serves the art as ideology itself. Nicolae and Elena Ceausescu's social realist portraits became a mixture of absurd elements and basic didactic narratives. For example, in order to legitimize her new political power, the past of Elena Ceausescu needed to be reinvented. Therefore, despite her advanced age and her here to non-existent Communist Party involvement, a young revolutionary Elena started to appear on canvases and within the pages of history textbooks during the 1970s. This visual cacophony seems not to bother the artists and the viewers. Was this the gateway for accepting unreal elements in official state-sponsored paintings? In his May 1st, Eugen Palade paints the present and the past. The Ceausescu couple is painted not during the communist revolution past, but celebrating the memory of communist revolution. A young and elegantly dressed couple occupies the foreground of the painting, followed by a crowd also well dressed in celebration, carrying banners and flags. It is a small procession with a forest in the background and not the regular depiction of the May 1st celebration. Crowds flooding the main boulevard in an urban setting with banners and people waving from open windows of modern apartment buildings. In this case, it seems unreasonable to celebrate May 1st at the edge of a forest with what seems to be a storm gathering in a misty sky and with an almost unrecognizable young Elena Nikolai leading the crowd. Around 1974, propaganda art in Romania changed gradually from a Soviet socialist realism to a more local and nationalistic social realism. For the last two decades of their rule, socialist realist paintings show an increased level of unpredictable, contradictory visual narratives. During this period, Portraits of, Ceausche of, the Ceausescu, uh, of Ceausescu depict now functions that he performed in a superlative manner. The supreme commander of the Romanian army, the supreme leader, the father of the nation, and so on. Elena Ceausescu's public persona follows the same progressive path of representation. The political leader, the ideologist of the party, uh, the woman scientist, the great woman, and so on. Gradually, Elena Ceausescu represented a female version of all functions and roles that Nicolae Ceausescu exercised, except that of the president of the country. After Nicolae Ceausescu assumed the office of Supreme Leader of Communist Romania in 1974, Elena's appearances in public increased exponentially. Elena's right to perform these honorific roles mentioned above was associated with Nicolae Ceausescu's power. And because of these plaudits of, by association, the model of independent, powerful woman in communist Romania, for which Elena stood, was regarded with serious suspicion. The cult of Elena Ceausescu was not created in a vacuum. The reapplication of visual symbols already used in social realist paintings makes possible a quick transfer of power because they appeal to a public which already recognizes the message of the paintings. However, could the reusage of the visual symbols of socialist realism also weaken its didactic message? Nicolae and Elena Ceausescu's official portraits are often signed with generic group names. For instance, the collective of, followed by the name of an institution, village, city, factory, school, and so on. The paintings were commissioned after the Ceausescu couple tour around the country or to memorialize celebratory occasions such as their birthday or national holidays. Most of them entitled Homage, these paintings had a didactic purpose. Masses must worship the leaders. 
The didactic painting fails to meet its didactic aim if the viewer fails to catch its clues. In paintings that belong to the category of homage, such as this, the title often seems artificially added to the painting. Even though painting may contain the visual symbols required by congratulatory art, it may not always iterate its purpose. The realistic depiction of the subject matter, the repetition of the same visual codes, and the standard composition of the painting enclose a fictional element. This illusionary elements element resides not so much in the design elements of the painting, but in the immediacy with which the viewer sees these elements as symbols for homage. In other words, visual elements such as pioneers offering flowers to the dictators, the dictators saluting a cheering crowd, or dictators surrounded by happy workers, despite the realistic depiction, become implausible for the viewer. The repetition of these dogmatic images intended to educate the viewer might empower the viewer. The viewer of socialist realis realism might find the images unfamiliar precisely because of their over-familiarity. Familiar In other words, the couple's ubiquitous visual representation creates a disbelief in the painting's capacity to represent reality. For example, a painting of Elena Ceausescu at work in her laboratory, surrounded by bouquets of flowers, should read, people expressing gratitude for love and love for their scientist leader. Because Elena Ceausescu dedicated her entire career as scientist and her entire life as mother and wife to the building of communism for the good of all Romanians, the relationship of all Romanians ought to have with their leader is one of eternal gratitude. The familiarity of this visual association between her likeness and flowers leaves the viewer wondering, did in fact anyone send her flowers? Or to recall her unpopularity among Romanians, who would ever send her flowers? <laughs> Socialist realist paintings urge dogmatic messages, but the, but the overuse of social realist symbols creates a familiarity of the viewer with the image that undermines the message. Homage becomes a generic placeholder for a more specific title. A painting title homage would present no challenge for the viewer since the title announces visual symbols familiar. If the painting uses some unexpected visual representation, even in a minor way, these elements could become telling. The official symbols become a background for such elements. Precisely because of their overuse, symbols such as bouquet of flower became potential site of interpretation. Augustin Lukács paints Ceausescu's visit at the car factory Aro in an unpredictable manner that does not resemble the original inspirational painting of Mao and his visits around the country. Typically, working visit, visits paintings depict the dictator surrounded by happy worker workers crowding him with flowers or attentively um, listening to his explanations and sometimes taking notes during his speech. The background uses images to identify the site visited by the leader, fields of corn or wheat, electric plants, smoking plants, etc. However, this painting shows an isolated dictator cut between five arrow cars. The glorified dictator gesticulates, but it is not clear if he is in the middle of, the sp of a speech or just asking a question. He seems trapped between a dark blue background and a bouquet of red carnations in the foreground. Although the painter employs the bouquet of carnations as a symbol of gratitude and connection between the dictator and the people, the flowers now could also mark a separation between the dictator and the people. The carnation seemed to block his only way out from between the arrow cars. The bouquet of carnation resists a single interpretation, and so it complicates the didactic role of socialist realism. Could the portraits function as both inspirational propaganda art and as visual sign open to interpretation? A successful, a successful propaganda portrait should always send the same message, even to viewers not familiar with the subject of the official painting. For example, a common practice in the visual representation of dictators 
the leader is portrayed alone with the sky as a background and quote watching over quote, the future of the country. In his homage to Nicolae Ceausescu, artist Ion Bizan portrays a leader not so young and not so confident in the middle of a blue vastness. His age is shown in his white hair and his facial expression. Exhaustion more than power seems to radiate from his slightly lifted hand. Nothing grounds the leader. No symbols of power are crowding the backgrounds. Instead, the pale blue seems to threaten to tip his body backwards at any moment. His homage was accepted by the official drum with few reservations, perhaps because of the what they call just an odd aesthetic choice. In Alexandru Cukurencu's homage, Ceausescu wears the signs of power more obviously to supplement the rest of the painting, which is unsettled. Although undated, the painting was probably commissioned after Ceausescu's controversial coronation as the president of the Socialist Republic of Romania in 1974. His, and we know that because he's holding the scepter, which was designed for this occasion. It seems that the landscape and the group of children playing next to him are not helping to enhance the reading of the paint, painted scene as a symbol of his power. The narrative should be the father of the nation watching over the country and its future, represented by the young generation. Instead, it might be read as a young generation plays unaware of his presence. The landscape looks deserted and somewhere at the periphery of a big industrial city, picture in the far background. This painting can be understood as an indeterminate sign because it tries to be obvious in its message, but it resists just one reading. It is unsettled because the official style in Romanian propaganda painting regresses to an almost childish innocence. It seems that the painting should be transparent and innocent in execution in order to deliver a transparent message. Probably one of the most frequent symbols, visual symbols associated with Elena Ceausescu's portraits, besides political leader, heroine, mother, and wife, is Elena is a scientist. Her portraits as scientists follow the rules of the official socialist realist portraits mentioned earlier. Obvious narrative and using symbols easily identifiable to deliver a didactic message. For example, Composi composition centers Elena Ceausescu against a red background surrounded by a collage of rectangles depicting scenes from scientific research. Although Elena Ceausescu appears just once in the center of the painting, the painting should read Elena Ceausescu, the scientist, working on new discoveries. In other words, the women we see in the small rectangles working in the laboratory, although clearly not Elena, are the embodiment of Elena. Elena is all of them and none of them in particular. To help the viewer make this transition, we could argue that half of Elena's silhouette appears in the right corner rectangle. With her back to the viewer, she is overseeing two women working in the far background. And this right there in the corner. Sorry, I don't have a. If we follow this thought, we notice this time a less resembling pink silhouette of Elena appearing in an upper left um, rectangle. As though by magic scientific power, her body painted in the center and covering three quarters of the painting shrinks and migrates at will in all other spaces in the painting. And if you look harder, you will just find more this entire visual lesson aims at the image in the center. The cues for the message of the painting resides in her averted look, her smile, and the doves painted inside the blue rectangle placed above her head. The paper she holds tells the viewer that she has a message to deliver, a new discovery, which will contribute enormously to the future of the country. The rectangle above should depict the movement from particular to general. Therefore, the blue rectangle and her averted look read not just as her contribution to an optimistic future for all of us, but also contribution to a peaceful world. One of Elena's greatest ambitions was to discover something that was not just of crucial national importance, but something that would also garner her international acclaim. 
The artist's job was to create in the minds of the viewer, of viewers an immediate recognition of Elena as an imminent scientist. Her presence on canvas appears in countless variations of reused, easily recognizable symbols from chemistry and light industry. By late 1980s, the visual connection of Elena's portrait and symbols depicting her role as a chemist and savant were so entrenched that even her depiction in other roles, such as political figure or mother, would incorporate chemistry laboratory equipment. For example, um, Valentin Tanas in homage shows Elena Ceausescu lecturing who is her audience and what is the subject of, the, of her lecture. The social realist painting should provide a clear answer to these questions. By this time, Elena always had to be addressed as academician Dr. Engineer Elena Ceausescu, followed by other titles such as vi Vice President and, of course, Cameron. And always, well, that mean, really means always, like 40 times in a page of a newspaper, for example. Oh. You read the same thing over and over and over again. The subject of her talk is verified by previously discussed symbols of science and chemistry surrounding her and cluster more on, the le on her upper left side. Her audience takes notes during her talk, and you can see it on your right corner. Right? Um, however, we expect the audience to face her and not to be placed so far behind her. That is probably because Elena is facing us. The answer to the visual narrative question of who is her audience becomes also the message of the painting. The academician Dr. Engineer Elena Ceausescu is reading for all of us, as well as to past and present audiences who will be paying homage to her by listening. According to the Socialist Realist Aesthetic Code, the painting mm -hmm. depicts reality, but it's also it, but it also fills in reality with necessary fictional elements meant to better illustrate the real situation. In August 1934, at the first All-Union Congress of Soviet Writers, socialist realism received its definitive formulation in a speech by Andrei Zdanov, a supporter of socialist realism and a powerful political figure during the Stalinist period. End quote. This will be the definition of social realism, which I hope will explain. Comrade Stalin has called our writers the engineers of human souls. Although this is controversial and it seems that it's an avant-garde uh, term, uh, psycho engineers, that Tetriakov used way before Stalin. What does it mean? What obligations does this title impose on you? It means firstly that you must first know life in order to depict it in artistic productions, to depict it not scholastically, not in a dead fashion, not simply as objective fact, but to depict reality in its revolutionary development. At the same time, the faithfulness and the historical concreteness of the artistic depiction must be combined with the task of the ideologically refreshing and education of laboring people in the spirit of socialism. Such a method of artistic literature and literary criticism is what we call the method of socialist realism, end quote. And this will later be applied to all arts. Here, realism is not understood as some dreamy mock-up of reality, not even as mimicry of the socialist reality as it is usually described and differentiated from social realism, but as depiction of reality in its revolutionary development. Socialist realism is interested in showing the socialist future as a future anchored in reality. In order to do that, it must subscribe with, to Karl Marx's doctrine of dialectical and historical materialism. The social revolution, which happens in the present, is the final stage of a dialectical evolution as a final event which happens in the future. In other words, the present as it is already contains the future as a revolutionary outcome of the present. Therefore, socialist realism is oriented toward that which has not yet come into being, but it is to be created. A socialist realist painter paints reality as closely as possible by focusing not on the phenomena of reality, but on the revolutionary potential of things. Glorifying odes had titles and open letters from the people are saturated with expressions such as 
There are never enough words, or we cannot express enough our gratitude, which suggests the expectation of an all-encompassing Elena and Nikolai accompanying their images. The audience sees the couple always as more than what is obviously represented visually. What they stand, stand for spills over the edges of canvases and appears in and reappears on pages of textbooks, newspapers, magazines, and facades of buildings. There is an expectation that behind an homage painting there are hundreds of other homage paintings. In her homage, Alexandra Meiloyu shows Elena as a teacher with a young boy in school uniform beside her, but also as a politician. She's holding one of the three red books placed on the table. As a scientist, the profile of industrial plants painted as a background, and also as a mother, the presence of the child in the painting. The red book is not any book, but it's hundreds and thousands of books in one book, just as Elena is every Romanian woman. Also, the child is not just a child, but a pioneer. In visual propaganda, when pioneers stand be beside the cameras, they also stand for. And the flowers make this connection between people represented by the pioneers and the leaders. Therefore, the rose she holds becomes an offer from her student, but also from all of us. But what does it mean to witness over and over again the symbols being used and reused? Does the repetition of visual symbols reinforce or undermine the leader's power? In other words, by reusing the same photograph of Nikolai Ceausescu and Elena for different portraits, the artist becomes complicit in creating a scenario in which a constructed and reconstructed Elena is born. Is it possible that the symbols are so familiar that they become overlooked? I would argue that her visual presence as a scientist has become so ingrained in people's minds that she had become present even in images that do not show her directly. Her presence on canvas is not necessarily because she's now, uh, she's not necessary because she's now substituted by what she represents. Elena Ceausescu's image is not required because she herself is a symbol. For example, in one of many tapestries uh, dedicated as homage to Nikolai and Elena Ceausescu, all we see are symbols and images of objects representing um, industry, agriculture, chemistry, the arts, besides more obvious images of trains and vessels and more abstract symbols of peace and the globe. However, even though the Ceausescu couple is not visible, this tapestry is a portrait of them. This becomes clearer when the tapestry is paralleled with one of numberless photo collages paintings of the Ceausescu couple. Paintings such as this um, were commissioned to decorate institutions and streets uh, which were to visit, visited by the couple or to be carried by people at spectacles and uh, marches celebrating national holidays. From left to right, the tapestry's narrative is created by two defining elements, the colors of the Romanian flag, although, and although not visible, the map of Romania. Both the painting and the tapestry place the naval ship and water on the lower right corner, making it the real site of the Danube Black Sea Canal. Canal. The rest of the symbols are distribu distributed according to the real location of chemical plants, lower left corner, or uh, followed by a, a subway train built in Bucharest, which is the real site of Bucharest. The central area seems to, al al seems to also follow the physical map of Romania, the train in the mountains, but also a more allegorical representation of the heart of the country. The heart of the country is the golden age, Ceausescu's age. So that's the, the yellow part is also the place where um, the more abstract symbols are. The symbols themselves become symbols. For example, the symbol for peace is also the symbol for Ceausescu's era as the keeper of peace. And the central area is a portrait of the beloved couple regardless of their presence or absence. Chains of allegorical visual elements ensure the couple's presence. However, I would argue that precisely this efficiency of visual symbols could weaken the didactic power of many of these official paintings. Art produced inside the official dogma 
undermines the symbol of power not by mocking them but by overusing them until the visual language stops serving the power and turn against it. For example, in dogmatic paintings such as this, the message should read Ceausescu exercising power over nature. Um, we know that Ceausescu's ambition was to have the largest collection of trophies in the world. Romanians commonly refer to his hunting trip, trips as slaughtering trips. Before his arrival, animals were hoarded for days toward food stands around which shooting towers were built for Ceausescu to shoot, making it practically impossible to miss. Um, and all these paintings are done after photographs. So I do have a book with photographs, which is just heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. The dark hill shows Ceausescu leaning toward each other, smiling and admiring the corpses of five brown bears lying, uh, laying at their feet. Their presence in the dark forest at what seems to be sunset implies secrecy about the killing of the bears rather than a celebration of a fruitful hunting. We witness just what the flashlight re reveals to us. The bears, as is the case in several of the homage paintings at their feet, give the impression that the line of dead bears would continue in our visual space, implicating viewers in this almost innocent story about hunting bears in the forest. Such symbolic ambivalence is prevalent throughout homage paintings dedicated to Ceausescu couple. In anniversary, artist Dan Hatmanu shows the Ceausescu couple with glasses of champagne celebrating the anniversary of Nicolae Ceausescu. And we see the date right there, January. Um, the message should be the glorious past reaching out to celebrate the glorious future. In the left corner, there is a painting of Stefan the Great, a well-known historical figure dead by hundreds of years by now, reaching out from a painting with a glass of champagne. Where do we place this painting in the line of Mao, Stalin, Hitler's portraits? Anniversary seems not to be part of the socialist realist tradition, but at the same time, it is that not oppose this tradition either. The tension between official rhetoric and its aesthetic representations and everyday practice created a duality in which symbolic depiction and literal depiction of the Ceausescu couple as parents of all Romanians translated in questionable um, effects of visual socialist realism. For example, as a consequence of Ceausescu's demographic politics, which made abortion illegal and a crime against the state, the visual representation of him deterred from a leader to a father figure. Therefore, alongside their representation as the two leaders of the country, Romanian population should also know them as inseparable entity, the great couple, the beloved mother, and father of the nation. These paintings had to promote family values and pro-natalist politics. Bearing children was praised labor indeed as uh, Gail Clickman observes in her book, The Politics of Duplicity, having children was essentially reproductive labor. The state demanded that each family produce four or five children and mothers who reached the quota of five children earned the status of heroin mothers. Paintings mentioned earlier with pioneers surrounding the dictators were also intended to suggest this ideal family. The Ceausescu couple will appear in endless paintings such as this one, surrounded by four or five children carrying flowers or books. What seems to differentiate them from homage paintings is their intention to look like family portraits. However, the absolute leader has the unquestionable privilege to appear in an improbable or impossible story without interrupting his function of exercising power over nature. Uh, na na nation. The Ceausescu started to be painted in romantic spaces where an eternal spring surrounds a joyful couple. This nearly mythical allegory seems to fail the original didactic purpose that the socialist realism assure viewer immediate recognition of the Ceausescu couple as representing the stability and creation of a healthy socialist nation. 
The depiction of the Ceausescu couple as mother and father of the Romanian nation is not done in a symbolic way, as we saw in earlier paintings, where young children in uniform bring flowers to the parents. In paintings such as Eugen Palades Homage, the representation of the Ceausescu couple as parents of their own nation is painted in a literal way. By 1986, when this painting was commissioned, Nicolae and Elena were in their late 70s. However, in a rather awkward way, a young Ceausescu, young Ceausescu couple holds and displays to the entire nation the future they built for Romania. And this would be the last image. Sabine Balasha in his homage shows the Ceausescu couple floating in an uncertain space surrounded by doves, the bust of a young reborn generation on the right and flying little girls and boys toward the promising future on the left. The artist uses the symbol of the Ceausescu couple as protector of the young and stewards of peace so literally that the compositional awkwardness of an eternal, forever young couple floating and waving makes the painting vulnerable to irony. Such visual exaggerations of the dogma, instead of glorifying the dictator, appear to subvert the very authority figure they intend to lionize. By tempting the viewer's interpretation, the visual message exceeds the generic boundaries of socialist realism. Thank you. I, I'm sorry if it was too long. I'm not sure. Oh. I feel like I have been talking for the last five years about <laughs> socialist realism. <laughs> about this brainwashing uh, well, as I write about it, is that um, this repetition comes also with a kind of, a, as you said, brainwash, kind of mechanical way to look at things until you don't see it. Probably they did so many portraits, they could have done it with their eyes closed. Uh, some of these artists, artists um, are very well known for their kind of avant-garde work <laughs> and if it's it's very it, not just shocking but it's very interesting how they will put that aside do 10 15 portraits because they had to every month they had to exhibit something about the dictator so there is a kind of a disbelief in it 
in this repetition that comes from before even starting to paint, which the viewers also is aware of. So the repetition just, it seems that it reinforces this big lie that we have to do it and we have to see it. Um, so I start from that in, in the way I see them. Um, this is sort of related, related to that. I mean, I, I'm wondering if it's really a question of the repetition that's triggering it. Mm -hmm. And if um, the issue isn't at least as much that there's a kind of culture of skepticism that's mm -hmm. existing underneath the, the sort of ideology that's being spoken fed to people and um, causing virtually any image to have a kind of ironic dimension for the viewer. And I think it would be an interesting piece in your research to try to track that um, and to think about ways the artist might be exploiting mm -hmm. or not exploiting that. I don't know if there's it would, be too, would have been too dangerous to put such thoughts in writing, probably. But, but maybe there is a kind of, I mean, the, the other question I have, which is, let's bracket that for a moment, on the other side, is if they were doing this, why were they allowed to, to exist? Right. And they were all accepted as official yeah. paintings. We'd know um, an exhibited, for example, Dan Hadmanu, in a recent interview in 2009, about um, this painting, this specific painting. Um, he said that I was an artist, I was a portraitist, I was painting portraits. I did not paint a dictator. It was a portrait for me, what I did. And, but about this painting, he says, it should be read between the lines. There is something there that the party couldn't get. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure what he didn't say, but, um, but it's very hard to go and talk to artists about it because they don't want, and if they want it, they, they want to justify somehow something that might not be there. <laughs> That's not the point. <laughs> you were talking about interviewing the artist, but of course what you're really uh, interested in is the, the consumer's reaction. Mm -hmm. So have, have there been interviews with people who consume this, this kind of art? And I, I was also wondering, was there any satiric underground insurgent art uh, to balance this. Usually there's some... Right, right. Um, I did not interview the consumers. I would, I would have to interview the whole <laughs> country. You'd have to sample. I, I, I would probably have to do that. that. That's a project in itself. What I mean is you don't have to interview everybody. You figure out how Right, to absolutely. But, but um, I will just start with, with people's reaction to my research. We, that can be a sample. <laughs> including my family. Why do you have to look at this again? And why do you have to spend your time and energy and creativity on this? D didn't you have enough? Uh, families never like your research topic. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that would be one of the reaction is why? So I will have to justify first, why do I have to do this? Why do we have to look at this again? So I think that's telling about the audience what they want to do with them. Put them in the basement and leave them there. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of your question. Okay. Is there, was there insurgent art? Did yes. people do satiric art on walls and things? This is one of the main points that I, I hope I will make it clear as I keep writing. Um, we do not have an underground movement as we had Sad's art in, in, in Soviet Union, for example. Um, that doesn't mean artists did not produce art other than official art. Um, but it was more um, at a very isolated, personal level. Um, they're not, there are no spaces they exhibit what they were producing. Not intended to be ironic in any way, not intended to be subversive, but just to do something else than this in terms of sculpture, installation, video, photographs. So it was very hard, to, it was done, and books are written now about it, but the thing is, um, it was very isolated. So you, it could not be a movement. Yes. So. I guess I want to follow up on the question of um, subversion and uh, consumer reception of these paintings. And um, I don't have an art historian perspective. I am a historian. <laughs> uh, 
but I, I think that um, you are making really a great contribution to the studies of communism in general. Um, and the way to kind of uh, interpret this is to look at the historical literature about the relationship between the totalitarian state and individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, I, I, I think that this is really the, uh, the essence here and, mm -hmm. and you know, something that you, you could develop and make a really significant contribution. Um, and you, you, you talk about this a little bit in your paper, but if you see communism as a process of negotiation between um, the state and society, that puts these, pa these paintings in a totally different light. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it is a process that is going on on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, individuals do have power. And what you are doing, you are looking at that power at so many levels. One level is the artist, another one is the consumer. Um, so I, I'm, I'm wondering, it's a comment, but also a question, <laughs> if, you, if, if your interpretation is going in that, in that direction. It definitely, it, it started as, mm -hmm. it, that, that's why in the beginning I use uh, posters and everything which was not signed. I did not select big names, I was interested in what was out there for everyone done, not necessarily as a, um, and and I was also looking at the textbooks and what people had in their houses, what was in every single classroom on top of the blackboard, his portrait, and how the portrait changed, things that were affecting people, and how, how it was this overusage affecting the everydayness, because for example, um, um, I always had a little pin and I put together the first page of, of all my textbooks. Because the first page is a very, every single book published will be his portrait, her portrait, and the homage text for a few pages. And that was so, that's what, uh, uh, that's what I want to get somehow with the over usage. Is this, it's not that you are not aware it's there. Of course, you can see the huge portrait covering the facade of a building if you pass by, but somehow you have the power to ignore it. Um, you know, the record there, I can see it just gets pounded in over and over again, and after a while, whatever belief you started out with, I can see that was there. You're right, and, and you, you talk about boredom with that, you're yeah. absolutely, but I think it's more than that because it's a, it's, it's also a reinforcement of an ideology which is a lie. So every time you see the portraits, or you see these happy people and happy mothers holding children uh, when half of them were in prison for abortion, uh, illeg illegal abortions, then you see it's a lie and it's reinforced and that gives you a little bit of... Is that statistical information in your thesis, like the numbers of women in jail for abortions it in will the be in the of these particular... In the chapter on Elena. That would, I think, be a way to kind mm -hmm. of, because that's sort of missing from this version mm -hmm. of the right, talk. Right, right. And I think um, it was very successful when you talked about the quantities of material used to build the mm -hmm. palace. I mean, it just kind of renders it very, very concrete. And I think that would be information that would be very helpful. There have been great books written about the, yeah. the, the period of um, illegal abortion in Romania. Yeah, Morello, I, I mean, I, I know we're, we're hitting on you on this, this issue of art, and but I think... Please do it, now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'm well, still the, into the, it. The moment that, that, that I became discomforted was when you used the phrase, the viewer, the first time you mm -hmm. used the viewer, because... Uh, now, and, and over time, as I thought about that, because, you know, my own work has been so in, involved in the question of how individual discontinuous collections of viewers are assembled into an, an aggregate viewer and how, in, in our case, post-war mass market capitalism operates to do that, to make, to make a kind of consensus. And, and it seems to me that that, as I read, as I thought about this, I thought, well, actually, you have the same, you have the same opportunity in some senses. That is, it's probably one way, one subtext of your piece should be the attempt to construct a single unitary viewer. Mm -hmm. 
the, a the viewer, a the Romanian viewer. And, and so all of this work is, in some sense, designed around a, a function of, of enforcing, and, well, of, in, in, in a totalitarian system, totalitarian system, enforcing, in our case, persuading or, mm -hmm. or, or bribing, whatever you want to call it, a kind of uniformity of identity. And that seems to me a way that you can you can resolve this, and then you can have a, a like a a, a, a narrative, a, a kind of wonderful evolving narrative, which is that there's the struggle of the state to generate this kind of single unitary view mm -hmm. that operates from and every way from from <coughs> propaganda of art, the visual art, to the imprisoning of people who who disobey. But then you have this other as you move through the narrative then come to the point where you can introduce the notion of, of course, human beings do not, in fact, become the automata that the state desires them to become. So then, in the second, in a certain sense, the second half of your argument can also be the second half of the book, which is about the ways that forms of resistance emerge. And, and what Han said, I think, is really apt, mm -hmm. which is to say to, to and, and you point that, I mean, when you, the fact, the very fact of turning the page mm -hmm. in that moment, you know, where you have to go past that, um, that's, <coughs> that has to happen. To get to the first page of text, one is, is forced into a performance which one must necessarily resent, and which must necessarily be um, a, a, a continually reconditioning of the very thing, the very rupture that you're talking about. So if you you can you don't have to do the kind of sampling that's being said, you know the sociological sampling method. There are all kinds of reasons why that that won't work anyway, um, and it has to do with repress. You know all the things you're you're yeah. like saying people repress, they deny, they they deflect. They it it seems that there is no way out. If I start doing that, there is that's where I will just well, and, and stop. And you're not going to get honest responses, no matter how large your agency no. is. Uh, so so you have to do it differently. But I think you, I think you, you should make the concept of the viewer, not this kind of uh, kind of fuzzy abstraction of crit of, of historical writing, but mm -hmm. rather an actual active part of your dynamic, the attempt by the state to create a single unitary viewer. Um, and of course, there's the, the the dialectical relation because it's also creating a single unitary subject, which is. Mm -hmm. You know, them. And and they even fail to become single and unitary. They get younger, they get older, he gets plumper, he gets skinnier, they they, they become, you know, they, they have like arthritis in their right elbow, they they have buck teeth and then they don't. I mean there are all of these ways in which um, in which you can um, you can also speak to the way that even in, in the attempt to artistically create a unitary view mm -hmm. the failure takes place. And then you, then you can have a really fun, you know, uh, uh, a narrative in your in your analysis. I have to go right now. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I will take I, I'll, 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 let Peter take it because I got one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, you know you know I love this book. Yes, no, no, it, and, and you're absolutely right. Um, I, I was hinting at the collective, but it, this is another word that doesn't quite say and anything. There must be a fair amount of political history writing about, about the roiling resentments of mm -hmm. the Romanian people and their respect condition. What Hannah said, I think, is right, that you don't have to bring a lot of it up, but you just have to both bring up why, mm -hmm. that is, the sheer amount. The number of buildings torn down, that was the one that when you first told me that, uh, you remember I fell off the chair and I had to be revived with smelling salts. And, well, and yeah, right. that, that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it, but the point is that I, I even thought about um, adding to each part of what I'm writing about some kind of a reaction now now to what, what is happening. Like, yeah. Um, for example, in the chapter about Elena, there has been exhibitions showing her um, surrounded by political figures now in the parliament in a completely different um, or for example there is a huge space in front of the palace that uh, they want to build a huge monastery which has to be one meter taller than the palace to kind of save the 
space from this kind of monstrous thing that happened, which is just adding another huge building and a space which can be used for anything else, like connect. But, that, but somehow it keeps me connected with what is happening, it keeps reminding me that the individual that I'm trying to reach. Well, you it's that you can make these, these moments as kind of uh, epigraphs that begin each chapter. Or end. Yeah, 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 yeah. Each chapter. Yeah. <laughs> I think Catherine, sorry. Um, Thank you. It was a real pleasure to see these paintings alongside the paintings of Mao and Hitler and so on. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, they all used photographs. Uh, he never uh, s set for a painting. He hated to do that. Uh, so I, I can picture artists getting the same photograph. And then here they go in their uh, studios and have to produce this portrait for next show, which is, they have to, they're workers. They get a salary. They have to produce portraits. Or they will get a team, like a... This is the title, visits at the factory of this, this, or the hospital. And you have a few photographs here, and we need this size po images, and they have to do it. And that moment when he sits and decides, OK, how am I going to do this to be safe and to get paid and keep going with what I'm doing on the side eventually? And there is a deconstruction there. That's what I was trying to. I'm trying to, 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 to point to this constructed image where they are all kind of com complicit in this story where she gets younger or he gets younger. My question is maybe for some of the other art historians in the room as well as for you, but it seems to me that these there's nothing particularly socialist about these paintings. Mm -hmm. So it's a, there, it's a genre of authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious to hear what you think. <laughs> Um, 
Soviet Union, uh, like Russian socialist realism. In um, in Ukraine, we'll look in a certain way with some some kind of national decorations of the back and the costumes. In Romania, we'll look in a certain way. Um, but there is something that is common to all, and there are, uh, the theme. It's a nationalistic in form, right? Socialist in content. That was the. <laughs> the theme. So it is okay, even for Mao, you can do it in ink, and, and they did it in ink, but it was Mao on the foreground and um, the industrial sites in the background. So it, it can be adapted, that was the point actually, to kind of unify the Soviet Union, uh, which is again another way to look at communism as a political um, doctrine through art. Um, is it different from, say, Thank you. Or, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, the only what came to mind, two things came to mind, was the, the you know all the great King Philip paintings by Velasquez and and similar, and then um, that extraordinary painting of Louis in the uh, in the high heels showing his leg, <laughs> you know, which we always used to teach. Yes. In, in, I used letter. to parallel that with so many things. It always worked for yeah, yeah. for introduction yeah. to art history. But, but I, I actually think that I, can, I cannot, you know, I, I'm not a grown-up art historian, but I can't remember, I cannot think of any, any where, probably because the power is so stable mm -hmm. that, um, mm -hmm. that the, the, the portrait does not have to do that work. Mm -hmm. It serves a different kind of, of job. Roman, Roman uh, Augustus, some of his portraits have this strange overexpressive. Yeah. It, to me, I was wondering if, if anybody had done any historical work on the, the specific tradition, uh, earlier tradition that these images came out of, like vaudeville, the over, the too much facial expression on mm -hmm. the children. I was wondering mm -hmm. that must have history. Uh, for socialist realism in Romania, or? No, um, in art, in the uh, tradition of art in Eurasia, deeper, 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 um, lodged than just in one period. Art doesn't just come out of nowhere. Right, right. Uh, well, it, it seems that um, they start educating with the usage of social realism as depicting reality as it is, like Courbet and Dumier. And Yes, but, I, but the function of the individual figures is very different than that. Right, absolutely. And that's but, the more imperial. Well, but, but that's, right, and that's exactly the point, that it has nothing to do with realism, actually, socialist realism, because depicting reality as it is was a subversive act. And instead of depicting the individual as a hero, if you're depicting him as a starving, tired, dirty worker, th that will be, and um, even Ion um, Grigorescu, a contemporary artist tells the story that when a friend of his exhibited during communism a large <coughs> realistic painting of a huge piece of red meat and a knife, mm -hmm. it was rejected. It was very realistic. It was rejected because you could not find fresh meat on the market at that moment. So it wasn't realistic? It, it wasn't realistic, but it was realistic <laughs> by... by <laughs> By all standards <laughs> of visual codes. It was allegorical. It was not allegorical. Are you sure? It was a real piece of meat. Maybe they found it somewhere. <laughs> no, the subject right. matter choice. Right. Right. So um, I, I will look into it. But um, in other studies of social realism in so the Soviet Union, um, I could not find where well, there is a lot of subversive art doing um, in Soviet Union. But that they 
don't quite, I don't want to say this is subversive because it's not the way it was subversive, intended to be subversive and out there and mocking and it's a um, different... I'm thinking of a different corpus of artists, not necessarily the, mm -hmm. the word that... Okay. Yeah. Yes. I almost hesitate to say this, but I found these paintings rather pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why. First of all, uh, I've seen lots of propaganda posters, the uh, Art Institute had a lot of propaganda, both German and uh, fascist, German fascism, communism, all that. And I found it very soft. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I go back to the comment that Saturn made that you have these cars, very industrial, very stark, but it was softened by flowers. And the dictator looked rather confused. He didn't <laughs> go like this. He was a bit <laughs> eerie. And then uh, the bears, the bears that were shot, it didn't look brutal. The bears looked as though they were sleeping and nature was very beautiful. So there's something very distinct mm -hmm. about this. And I was thinking, is this direct? I never thought that these paintings have a soft side. I have to <laughs> say, I never saw them, but I will. I will think about it. <laughs> Thank you. There's a parallel art that, in terms of what you um, mentioned about the attractiveness and perfection of things, American uh, commercial patriotic art. I'm thinking of Mort. Uh, what's his name? Um, It's uh, one of the arguments why 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 the Soviet Union didn't say anything when he publicly said I will not invade Czechoslovakia. Like, who are you? We are all invading Czechoslovakia tomorrow, and they were all shocked. Why didn't the tanks just drove by Romania and enter the country in their way to how how could could they let him go with this? And uh, well, I, it's almost a, as an anecdote, but actually it's true. It's because they were not afraid that he will dismantle communism or something in Romania. They knew that out of all dictators, he will be the one who will stay put. And, and nothing will change in Romania. Even if they wanted to implant some change, it, will not, it, it did not happen. What they call it is a new Stalinism, what happened in Romania in the 70s. Kind of dynastic Stalinism, they call it, which is um, even a more efficient version of whatever was trying to be implanted in, in the Soviet. So it is a unique moment where they work against the Soviet Union, but not because they were against communism, you're right. So 
yes, there is some kind of ambiguity there of political situation that comes through. Well, I'd like to invite everyone to join us at our reception and to thank Marilla. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Very, very nice. I have so many things to think about. Yeah, yeah. But it was so hard to put everything together sure, yeah. because you cannot show images without the history, but you cannot go into too much history because you want to talk about images. Um, but in the thesis, you can do that. Right. I, I have to because it's it's my way to understand them. Yeah. But I think this is helpful. Observations about yeah. what makes this place different at this mm -hmm. time. Also, it makes those pictures really yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so and it's such a, an intuitive connection that I didn't. It's like, of course, that's why I'm, I want to talk about 70s and 80s because it was this moment that was awkward in many ways, political and. Um, yeah, Gosha is, is great. She's in my dissertation committee, and she always <laughs> uh, points to it. It's like, but didn't he? Is it yes? <laughs> of course.